Now, when somebody donated a painting, it was put, not surprisingly, in a ledger. And the ledger said the name of the painting, the name of the artist, the name of the donor, and the date of donation. And that was all. So it is a sort of detective story as you try to find out something about the donor. Now, we have to find out a little bit about the donors, about their life. Were they interested in art or did they just have a painting on the wall? Um, where did they make the money? Were they part of a well-known Glasgow firm? All these things we try to find out. And it's much easier nowadays because of course so much is digitized. We've done about 220 uh, paintings. Um, oh, sorry, 220 donors. It actually goes into hundreds of paintings. Um, and a third of them are female. And when we get a woman donor, our hearts sink. Now this article by Rosemary Goring will show you why? Because half the population, she says, has been airbrushed from history. And I just ask you to look at the, 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 the uh, extract at the bottom. It says that these lives remain hidden is largely because public records and positions of power were the preserve of men. Six uh, instances of uh, women who gave paintings probably the beginning of the 20th century. Some of them are typical, some of them, thank goodness, are not. And I hope you'll find them interesting. Now, I'm going to start always with the painting. And uh, this painting shares its title. This is a Victorian painting. And it shares its title with another painting, which is in the Burrow Collection. And this is that painting, and they are both called The Judgment of Paris. This one is a, a 16th century painting. And just to remind you, of course, I'm sure you all know that Paris was a shepherd boy. He was wandering through the woods one day, and he came upon three naked ladies. And of course, he knew they were goddesses because they were naked ladies. And one of them had an apple in her hand. And she gave the apple to Paris and she said, your task is to say which is the fairest of us all. Well, they all tried to bribe him. But the one who won was Aphrodite because she offered him the love of Helen, wife of Menelaus. And of course, we're talking about Helen and Paris and the beginning of the Trojan War. So let's look back at the two paintings together. And it is not, as we might have thought, a little boy with his aunties, flirting with him rather, but he is sitting there with an apple in his hand and a wooden horse at his feet. This painting was given was by Story, who is a well-known Victorian artist with a sense of humor. And it was presented by Mrs. Catherine McLean in 1914. It was uh, presented after she died in her will. Now, what do I know about Mrs. McLean? Well, I know her birth date. I know that she married because uh, she's in the censuses as a married woman, and I know that she died in 1914. Now, her husband was Joseph McLean, and Joseph McLean was from Govan, and he was a builder. He built many of the tenements in Govan, and he also rented them, and he made so much money that he was able to build this wonderful house in Bellhouston, this is Craigie Hall. So Mrs. McLean for 20 years was chatelaine of this house. With all that that meant, she had servants, she had a social position, um, but I don't know anything about her at all. 
I know that after he died, she sold the house and she moved to this house in the Park District of Glasgow. And she had a comfortable life again for 20 years with servants. And she died in 1914. And in her will, she left money, but she also left two paintings. One went to Glasgow and another went to a relative. And that is all I know about her. I don't even know if she uh, understood the irony in the painting that she left to Glasgow. My next uh, subject is a maiden lady. Her name was Christina Russell. And uh, in 1927, she gave three paintings to Glasgow. This one is maybe a little bit surprising uh, for the amount of nudity in it again. And it was by Cecil Ray. She left also Glen Affric by Horatio McCulloch and Locranza Castle by William Beatty Brown. Now these are paintings of some distinction because they are by, by West of Scotland artists. What do I know about Christina Russell? Well, I know when she was born, I know she didn't marry, and I know she died in 1939. She was the daughter of Thomas Russell, and this is Thomas Russell from the Bailey. And if you're in the Bailey and have your uh, sketch in the Bailey, um, you're, a, you're a prominent Glasgow man. And he was indeed, he was a GP, um, and he was at, time, uh, at one time president of the Agricultural Society. But one night I went to a reception in the old fruit market and there was the name of his firm, Russell Turnbull and Company. So he was important in the fruit market. He had a, four children, uh, two girls, two boys. Um, Christina a, stayed at home all her life. And one of the sons, the one who inherited the business, stayed at home also all his life and never married. That was Thomas. Uh, one other son went into business in London and the other daughter married and moved away. Now, by 1925, Christina was then living in a substantial house in Newark Drive in Pollock Shields. And a, her father had died, her mother had died, both brothers had died, and she was alone in a house, albeit with many servants. This is the time that she gave the paintings to Glasgow. So we have to assume that this was after the death of her brother, Thomas, that they actually probably um, belonged to him rather than to her. And she lived another 12 years uh, before her death in 1939. I don't know anything more about her. I don't know anything about her interests. I don't know anything more about, but the fact that she gave the paintings away would suggest that she didn't really have a great interest in art. Now, this is a different lady. This is Japanese Lady with a Fan by George Henry, one of my favorite paintings in Kelvin Grove. And it was given by Mrs. Lindsay, and she was, it said she was Mrs. Lindsay MD, which sent me in the wrong direction. Um, it's just that Mrs. Lindsay, Margaret Dykes were her middle names. And she gave it in memory of Colonel Barclay Shaw. Now, I couldn't find anything about Mrs. Lindsay on first trawl. So I went to Robert Barclay Shaw. Oh, sorry, I should have shown you the other painting she left. This is a Mediterranean port by Arthur Melville, which you will see rarely because it's a watercolor and it is absolutely beautiful and a, another, a Moorish pack horse by Joseph Crawhall. These are paintings of uh, great importance to Glasgow. 
So what did I know about Mrs. Lindsay? Well, I knew when she was born. I knew that she married Robert Barclay Shaw in 1878. So he was her first husband and that she died in 1942. So we're back to Robert Barclay Shaw. When he was only 19, he inherited the family firm, which was a builder's, and he made a lot of it. He, he uh, built three substantial houses in Pollock Shields and two or three tenements with shops in Shollands. He's in the Bailey, and he's in the Bailey because he was the builder of the 1888 exhibition in Glasgow. Now, just to give you just an idea of the exhibition, look at the footprint of the university and look at the footprint of the exhibition and you'll see what an amazing uh, thing this exhibition was. I'm not going to go into it any great detail, but the reason Barclay Shaw was in the Bailey was because they lauded him for having finished the exhibition on time and on budget. Very important. Now, the artist in residence at the exhibition was John Lavery, and this is one of his paintings of the exhibition. But he also painted Captain Ben Barclay Shaw. And of course, he was a captain in the volunteers, the, what would now be the TA, but of course, uh, many men in Glasgow were in the volunteers, which was a, probably rather a nice club to be in, in Glasgow. Uh, this painting was painted because he was also in this enormous painting, which we have in Kelvin Grove, of the visit of Queen Victoria to the exhibition. And he is somewhere about the third uh, column there to the right, to the, to the left. So um, he is a man of some distinction. You'll notice I have said nothing about Mrs. Barclay Shaw, because um, Everywhere we go, we find Captain Barclay Shaw. Now, uh, after they had, I'll maybe leave you with the, well, I'll leave you with the painting because it's really rather nice to look at. Um, <clears throat> this was in 1888. In, uh, towards the end of the, um, towards the end of the 19th century, they built, uh, they moved to an estate called Annick Lodge in Ayrshire. Now this has a lovely house on the estate and many farms. And they really moved there and left Glasgow. However, he was gazetted Colonel in 1902. So that's where we get the Colonel Barclay Shaw. He died in 1905, and uh, she was left a widow in charge of the estate, and she took a great deal of pains with the running of the estate. I went to Ayr, to the archives at Ayr, and followed uh, the returns for the estate throughout the years, and they did very well. She ran the estate with factors, of course, but she was in charge of the estate. In 1908, she married again and she married the Reverend William Lindsay, who was a, a minister in Kilmarnock, and I can find out quite a lot about him. Now, I have been trying all the way through to get an image of these women, and I could not get an image of Mrs. Barclay Shaw. But she was a business room. Now, some of you will have seen this painting because it hangs in the Saturnwood room of the city chambers. 
and a, it's called Spring Roundelay, and it is by A.E. Cornell, another of the Glasgow boys. Now we have, um, uh, we know that this was given by Miss Catherine Howden in 1914. Now Catherine Howden was the son, was the son, was the daughter of this man, James Howden, a boiler maker. And he was an engineer, an engineer who produced the forced draft engine for ships, which made them so efficient that we're told it saved thousands of tons of coal and also made the ships faster. When we were down with the Friends of Glasgow Museum at a, the Irvine Museum, at the Irvine Museum, it was David Graham who drew my attention to this, and this is one of the massive boilers, one of the massive Howden's boilers. Now, I was lucky with Catherine Howden because in one of the censuses, she was listed as a medical student. This picture is of assorted female medical students at the Queen Margaret Medical College. You remember that women could not study at university medicine, at, they couldn't study at university, but they certainly couldn't study medicine at university with men. And I will uh, talk about this a wee bit later, but suffice it to say that these are the women medical students. Now, I went to the archives in Glasgow University and they have the, uh, all the information about the Queen Margaret Medical College. Unfortunately, we don't know the names of, or maybe fortunately, we don't know the names of any of these women here because it's not a picture that has put the names with the, with the photograph, unfortunately. So I followed Catherine, I followed her through her ME. I followed her with all her class tickets through her medical years. And then I got to her final year and she disappeared. She did not graduate. Now this seemed rather odd. So I went back to her family history and she was in fact the daughter of James Howden's first wife, who died when Catherine was a teenager. And James Howden married again, and he had two sons by his second wife. And when we get to the year that was Catherine's final year, her stepmother took ill and died. And when you look at her death certificate, it says that she died of cancer after a nine month illness. So we can only presume that Catherine was persuaded or decided that she should leave medicine and look after her father and her two stepbrothers who were then only 10 and 11 years old. She stayed at home with them, and I find her in the census, and then her father dies in 1914, and that's when she gave the spring roundly to Glasgow. She then uh, had a comfortable life. She uh, lived uh, with a companion in the West End. She had a house at Cove, which you can find by going through the property lists. But uh, I knew nothing more about her until this period. Well, I'm sorry, I should maybe have said she was born in, 19, in 1875 and she died in 1925. And this appeared in the Glasgow Herald. And it says, Art Bequest, Valuable Etchings for Glasgow, the late Miss Howden's collection. She left 117 prints to Glasgow. 
of these, um, and I have seen some of them, there is a Rembrandt, there is a Durer, there are a various other prints all the way up to a contemporaries like Muirhead Bone. And a, I'm going to read, because there's no way a, any of us could read this, what is in the Herald. During her lifetime, Miss Howden was a generous patron of art and music in Glasgow and presented to the art galleries a valuable collection of 18 etchings and prints. That was before she died. That This was a, a, while she was still living. These and other works in the collection, which is as understood will be taken over by the corporation in the course of a few days, reflect the quiet and cultured good taste of their donor by whose generosity the art treasures of the city have been notably enriched. So here was a woman who um, was a collector and there's no reason to think that they were not her collection. I think they were her own collection and that was her interest. Who was interested in music in Glasgow, who was interested in art in Glasgow. Now, I can't find that she uh, was a member of any of the art uh, club, like Glasgow Women's Artists or, or, a, or a, the RGI. And you may be interested to hear that when I phoned the Glasgow Art Club, I was told that if it was before 1983, women were not allowed to be members of the Glasgow Art Club until 1983. So I then uh, managed to meet a descendant of one of her cousins who's still involved with the firm of Howden. And he could remember that there was a great aunt somewhere and I was hopeful that I might have got an image, but he didn't know where any of the photographs would be of the family. So I haven't got anything yet. Now, my next subject is Agnes Gardner King, who gave this painting of William Thompson as a young man by Graham Gilbert. Now, of course, he is a very well-known artist in Glasgow. And of course, we know that William Thompson became Lord Kelvin. And this was painted when he first became a professor at Glasgow University when he was 22. Now I'm going to say no more about Kelvin because everybody in Glasgow should know about Kelvin, but I'm going now to go on to Agnes Gardner King. I know that she married, she, she was born in 1857, I know that she didn't marry and I know that she died in 1929. Now, Jim, William Thompson had a brother James and a sister, Elizabeth. James and William were, of course, physicists and mathematicians, but Elizabeth was a painter. And she married the Reverend David King and moved to England, and she had two daughters, Elizabeth and Agnes. However, we must just go back to Elizabeth because she was an accomplished artist. And I was interested to find when I went to the National Portrait Gallery in London, that the portrait of Lord Kelvin, which hangs in the National Gallery, is by his sister, Elizabeth. So that lets you know what an accomplished artist she was. Now her daughters, Elizabeth became a writer and she has published books on her uncle, uh, Lord Kelvin, and Agnes became an artist. And at times they collaborated on children's books, Agnes would illustrate, Elizabeth would tell the stories. And we find Agnes in the list of a well-known United Kingdom women artists. However, Agnes had an ambition. She had always wanted to go to Fiji. So, Ah, uh, well, I'm sorry, I have missed a bit here, which I should have shown you. Um, 
this is a, 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 a sketch uh, a, by Agnes Gardner King of her mother and her uncles, William and James. And again, it hangs in the National Portrait Gallery in London. So that gives you some idea of her worth as an artist, because uh, they always talk, don't they? However, to get back to Fiji, Agnes had her ambition fulfilled in 1912, and she wrote a book about it, and it's called Islands Far Away, Fijian Pictures with Pen and Brush. Now, they uh, sailed on the Empress of Britain to Canada. They travelled across Canada by train, and Agnes was sketching and painting all the time. And in fact, some of her uh, paintings are in the National Canadian Archive. They then sailed to Fiji and they traveled all over Fiji. And this is a fascinating book because they went down rivers and up hills and over mountains and stayed with the natives and, and they really had a wonderful trip. Now, of course, they were supported. And of course, they were supported um, by the diplomatic uh, people who were in Fiji. But you have to remember that this was one generation away from cannibalism. Now, on the frontispiece of the book, there is this sketch. It's actually called a especially attractive little mite. Who's holding the baby? I would love to think it was Agnes King, but I suspect it was maybe her traveling companion. So I get to my last. And this is the lady who gave 20 paintings to Glasgow. She gave and I've taken two here just to show you. A woody landscape by Coro and Lochachre by Sam Bow. Paintings of some distinction again. And this is, of course, Mrs. Isabella Elder, the Lady of Claremont House. Now, I have to acknowledge here a wonderful book by Dr. John McCarthy with that title, The Lady of Claremont House, because it is a, an absolute example of how to research somebody and how to put her in context. And I would commend it to you as a good read about a Glasgow in the late 1900s, late 1800, no, late 1900s, I beg your pardon, uh, the late, uh, I beg your pardon, I'm getting all mixed up here. <laughs> the late 1800s, the 19th century, I'm trying to say. Um, now, Isabella Elder was born Isabella Ewer, and she married in 1857, and she died in 1905. She came from a shipbuilding family, and her brother, John Ewer, went to university to study engineering and shipbuilding, and his great friend was John Elder. And eventually, Isabella and Elder, uh, Isabella and John, got married in 1857. Now, this is a portrait of John Elder by Sir David McNee. And this is his statue in the Elder Park. I must confess, I took this photograph myself. And for once, it was too sunny a day. And uh, you may not be able to see at his feet there is an engine. And this engine uh, is uh, again one which improved the efficiency of, uh, of ships. And this is a 
model of the engine, which is in the Fairfields Museum. And if you really want to see a working model of the engine and to see its importance, there is a working model now in the National Museum of Scotland. Both Isabella and John were interested in the welfare of their employees. Isabella in the welfare of the wives, of the ship workers and the children. And uh, they set up quite a number of what we might call social schemes for them. Um, Isabella liked to make sure that the women were able to know how to uh, keep a house and cook properly and provide for their families. Unfortunately, John died in the early, early 1840s. No, John died when he was 42. And a, Isabella was left as a widow. And she inherited the shipyard. So she ran the shipyard for about nine months until her brother John could be released from a contract which he was working in Newcastle, obviously with help, but she was the owner of the shipyard. Once John came and took over the shipyard with relief, she relinquished her duties and devoted herself to traveling and philanthropy. She gave the Elder Park to govern. And this is the statue which was erected to her because of that. And you'll see that they keep Govan Park beautifully still. She gave the Elder Cottage Hospital to govern. And she also gave the library to govern. She funded it and it was a Carnegie library. Now I've spoken to a number of, I have a number of friends who are librarians and they still remember thinking, oh dear, I have to go to govern, I have to go to the elder library because she insisted that it had to be open on a Sunday because that was the time that working men to get to the library. And this continued right into the 20th century. The other thing that she did was as a benefactor to the university. She was very interested in female education, female university education. And she bought the land and she financed the building for a, the Queen Margaret College in Queen Margaret Drive. She also came to an agreement with the authorities that there would be a Queen Margaret Medical College and that the women would be educated by the same people as were educating the men at the university. Now, inevitably, after a while, this slipped a little bit and they started sending more junior lecturers rather than the professors. So she had already financed two chairs at the university. So she said, all right, that's it. She said, I'll stop financing anything else at the university. And it was very quickly sorted out. The girls, um, as you know, eventually were able to graduate and they were a, eventually a, the whole thing came together, but it took some time and it was really pioneering efforts by people like Isabella Elder that made sure that that happened. Now she is the only woman on the University Memorial Gates. You'll see her in the top right hand corner. Um, she got an honorary degree from the university. And just recently, one of the buildings in the university has been called after her 
the Isabella Elder Building. This is her, this is where she is buried in the necropolis. She originally put this up to her um, husband and her husband's father, but she is actually buried here in the necropolis. And her portrait was painted by Sir John Mealy. And at last, I have a picture of one of the women that I'm talking about. Now, lest you think I am denigrating women who were the support of their husbands, I took this photograph in Luxor because I was so intrigued. There is the Pharaoh in all his majesty. And if you go around the side, you'll find the Pharaoh's wife there, pushing him on. I thought that was rather nice from centuries and centuries and centuries ago. Now I have to thank all sorts of people um, particularly, I have to thank uh, some of the, uh, the archivists in, a, they are unfailingly helpful, whether you phone the Martin or Glasgow or, or uh, Stirling or anywhere, they are unfailingly helpful. And I should tell you that we do have a website. And all you need to know is that it's Glasgow Museum's Art Donors. And there you will find nearly a hundred stories of people who gave paintings to Glasgow. <laughs>